welcome everybody uh good morning united states good afternoon europe good evening central asia uh, my name is jos boonstra and i work as a researcher at uh, the center for european security studies in the netherlands our europe uh, central asia program eu cam is a co-organizer in this event uh, and i will be moderating uh, this session I would like to thank the Institute for War and Peace Reporting for taking the initiative uh, for this event and hosting it. We are meeting at a time of great distress. The war is raging in Europe. After two months of Ukrainian resistance against the Russian forces, uh, the latter have started yesterday a second offensive seeking territorial gains in the Donbass, but also seeking a win a first win for the regime. Whatever the outcome of this war, Russia and Ukraine will be different countries. One could imagine a future where the EU will speed up integration with applicant members, including Ukraine. Imagining a, uh, imagining a future of Russia is more difficult at this stage, although we could maybe imagine a country that will not play an active role in neighboring states. The war also heavily impacts Europe and Central Asia and far beyond. Today we will talk about Central Asia. Short-term impacts will certainly include economic challenges, as we will hear today. Longer term, Central Asia awaits political choices of national direction and international orientation. Today's panel will be able to help us think about the direction that develop developments may take. And with that, as a short introduction, I would like to invite uh, our partner, uh, Institute for War and Peace Reporting, Abakon Sultan Nazarov, to also uh, lead in a little bit with a few words. Uh, thank you very much, Jos, dear participants and speakers. Uh, uh, today is the 55th day of war in Ukraine. Uh, horrific and tragic events that are taking place as we speak are clearly affecting our region tremendously. Economy, strategic areas of foreign policy, trade relations, uh, the flow of direct investments, energy uh, diversification, and many more aspects uh, of cooperation are now changing significantly. Of course, it is too early to judge what some long-term consequences might come our way. But definitely, so it's important to present some pointers for the future to our policy analysts and decision makers in Central Asia. Uh, therefore, today's panel is our attempt to shed more lines on the ongoing crisis between the two countries and discuss the potential uh, ramifications it will have on our region. I'm thankful uh, for the Europe Central Asia Monitoring Initiative and the Center for European Security Studies and to Ms. Jos Bonstra personally, who coordinates the initiative for being a part of this discussion and moderating today's event. I'm also extremely happy to see such a distinguished group, group of researchers who agreed to join the panel and share their thoughts on current developments. And let me also remind uh, you that uh, this virtual expert meeting is part of a series under the Amplify, Verify, Engage, Information for Democratization and Good Governance in Eurasia, project funded by the Royal Norwegian Minister of Foreign Affairs. We are really thankful to the Norwegian government for being our long-term donor and partner. We are very happy to be holding this event today and look forward to seeing you all at our other offline and online events in the future. Thank you for your attention. And now let me turn the floor over to today's event chair and moderator, Ms. Jos Bonstra. The floor is yours. Thank you. Abakon, thanks a lot for these kind words and this introduction. Um, first, uh, I was asked to uh, share with you uh, a few uh, technical regulations. Um, so first, the event is held on record and is broadcasted via social media channels. We take occasional snapshots too. So in case you are not comfortable with that, uh, you may turn off your cameras, of course. But if possible, if you agree, please leave on the cameras so we can see each other. 
Secondly, please address all your technical event questions uh, to IWPR staff members, and uh, you can find them uh, in the chat box with IWPR in their name. Third, uh, we urge everyone, of course, in the audience to remain civil when asking questions during the Q&A session and abide by gender and conflict sensitivity. And last, uh, for the Q&A session, after the presentations, please drop your questions to the speakers in the chat box. Uh, we will use these questions in the session, uh, group the questions together. Uh, as time is very limited, I propose that we keep to these uh, uh, chat uh, box questions and uh, not go into uh, live questions. Uh, and then uh, to introduce the panel, and we have an excellent panel of four distinguished uh, speakers today. Let me just uh, mention briefly uh, their work and what they will speak about, uh, that the speakers after that can uh, speak one after another. The first speaker today is uh, Professor Maria Omelisheva, excuse me. She's a professor of strategy at the National War College uh, in the United States. She holds a PhD from Purdue University. Her research and teaching interests are focused on East European and Central Asian security and transition issues. Maria will discuss with us uh, the economic outlook for Central Asia and look into the impact that Western sanctions on Russia can have on uh, Central Asia. Next speaker is Lilian Posner. Uh, she's an independent researcher also from the United States. She also focuses on Eurasia. She has an MA from Georgetown University and pre previously worked as an assistant management director at the National Interest. In her contribution, Lilian will discuss the position of Central Asian migrants in Russia. Third up is Roman uh, Vakulchuk. He is a senior fellow at NUPI in Norway. He holds a PhD from Bremen University. At NUPI, he works on Eastern Europe and Central Asia in relation to economy, connectivity, and environment issues. Today, Roman will talk about energy security and the uncertainties that lie ahead in Central Asia in that regard. And last, and certainly not least, will be Paul Dunay. He's an academic advisor at the Marshall Center in Germany. He has a wealth of experience in Eurasian security matters. He pursued his academic career in Hungary and worked for several universities and think tanks in Europe and in Central Asia. Today, Professor Dunay will talk uh, with us about the choices that Central Asia will need to make in a changed post-Soviet space. And with that, uh, I propose that we kick off and I invite Maria to take the floor, please, Maria. Thank you so much for this introduction. I have a couple of slides that I would like to share with you. So bear with me for a second. Um, I don't know, participants now can see my screen, yes? Um, oh, oh, wonderful, so I'm gonna play from start. Um, I want to um, say hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all those who um, joined us um, virtually from different time zones and from all over the world. Also, I want to express thanks to the organizers, and I am really delighted to be part of this conversation of this panel with other distinguished panelists. Um, and my heart is with Ukraine, and I'm very much concerned about the consequences of this war for every region of the world, including Central Asia. So when the world learned about the gravity of unprecedented economic sanctions imposed on Russia in the wake of its insensible aggression against Ukraine, many Central Asian analysts warned that Russia's economic crisis will spell disaster for Central Asia. And it's understandably so. This is not the first time that Russia has been hit with um, economic sanctions. First time in 2014, in the wake of its annexation of Crimea, it was hit with a double whammy of economic sanctions and planet in oil crisis, um, all of which had devastating consequences for Central Asian economies. 
and um, there, are, there is every good reason to expect that the current crisis will be even more devastating for Central Asia. However, my argument is that this trickle down consequence of or consequences of Western sanctions on Central Asian economies will not be uniform. Um, they will be conditioned by both the type and degree of interdependence of the Central Asian republics with Russia, as well as Central Asian government's own um, anti-crisis policies and measures. So in the very limited time that I have, I would like to briefly sketch out some of these unique economic vulnerabilities of the Central Asian states to Russia, and I will put forth some ideas about ways forward. Okay, uh, let me, okay. So of the five Central Asian Republic, it's, it's Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan who are uniquely vulnerable to Russia through uh, their membership in the Eurasian um, Economic Union, which shapes the structure of their impacts, uh, imports. So Russia is a major trade partner for both Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. It's a number one importer for Kazakhstan, and it is a number two importer for Kyrgyzstan. And one of the consequences of this trade interdependence has to do with the interlockings of the local currencies with Russia's ruble. So if Russia's ruble's um, value goes down, it brings down the values of the local currencies. And since January, the ruble has lost more than 50% of its value. And uh, both the Kazakh tenge and the Kyrgyz som depreciated as well. Not as much as Russia's ruble, but nevertheless, they depreciated. And as the currency loses value, inflationary processes kicked in, especially in those countries that import many day-to-day -day goods. And this is most of the countries of the region. So in all countries of the region, but particularly in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, prices and services, uh, prices and the services and goods rose between 10 and 15% in the first three months of the year, affecting the most vulnerable, the poorest, uh, people in the population. So prices and basic necessities and services, as I said, rose 10 to 15 percent. Um, and about um, the, the, the people who are the poorest in the region, they spend about two thirds of their income on foodstuffs. So obviously it's going to influence them the most. The second uh, vulnerability is in the dependence on certain kinds of staples that Moscow um, imports to Central Asia. And um, when Moscow suspended temporarily or indefinitely the sales of those staples, such as grain, sugar, pharmaceuticals, oil, um, of course, all of these restrictions um, have been felt across all Central Asian states. The third area where the Central Asian states are linked to Russia and therefore vulnerable to Moscow is through labor migration and remittances. And there will be an uh, entire presentation on this topic today. Therefore, I will only say that um, as hundreds of foreign businesses left Russia and many Russia's own businesses closed down or limited um, you know, th their operations, we've seen labor migrants being laid off. And the ones who remain employed, um, um, their remittances have fallen in value. Last but not least, um, Russia's investments and concessional loans are also likely to dry out. They have not been significant to begin with, but they constituted a significant share of the Kyrgyz market and Kazakhstan too has been home of over 8,000 small, medium and large size Russian companies. So economic crisis in Russia will be felt in um, that area as well. So, what are the economic prospects for Central Asia in light of um, the impacts of sanctions on the Russian economy, which is projected to contract between 10 and 15% this year and moving forward, it's projected to grow very, very slowly, effectively erasing 15 to 20 years of economic gains for Moscow. So I'm gonna put forth three plausible short to medium term scenarios, understanding that um, there is still very significant uncertainty about the consequences of sanctions. And of course, um, you know, the, the, the actual economic outcomes in Central Asia will likely combine the elements of all of these scenarios, not necessarily and in one particular category. So the first scenario is what I call the adjusted interdependence with Russia. 
in this scenario, Russia retains a leading, even if diminished and modified economic position in Central Asia, particularly in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan, less so in Tajikistan and Uzbekistan, including through um, the Eurasian Economic Union, which is um, uh, slated to survive in um, this scenario. And I think there are several processes that are likely to steer the region towards this scenario. If history teaches us any lessons, historically, the countries of the region have kind of issued meaningful economic reforms favoring instead various forms of adjustments to the change in economic circumstances. And we've already seen a vortex of activity seeking to adjust to the sanctions regimes rather than reform the economies. Um, these adjustments include the rerouting of supplies of goods, through alternative distributors, moving uh, the headquarters of Russia's businesses to Central Asia. And more importantly, and this is something that we should keep a close uh, eye on, it is the establishment of regional alternatives to SWIFT that would allow Russia to trade with Central Asia, but also China and India, even while being under Western sanctions. Another thing that may work in favor of this um, um, uh, scenario is the fact that I mean, I cannot think of another alternative to Russia uh, in terms of uh, um, labor migration. So neither the Central Asian republics nor the neighboring countries can absorb the immense volume of labor migrants, which will probably continue to go to Russia, even, even though it's going to probably be in fewer numbers. And then there is the Soviet legacy, legacy of connected electric power grid, pipeline infrastructure, all of this will offer Russia avenues for staying plugged into the local economies, including through limited investments into the nuclear sector. But, but this scenario doesn't bode a positive economic outlook for the Central Asian countries. I think they, this scenario will result in very slow economic growth in Central Asia that will also roll back some economic progress they have made in the recent decade. Now, moving on to the second scenario that I call the geoeconomic rebalancing. In this scenario, we will see a gradual decoupling of Central Asian economies from the Russian one, but they will increase their dependence on another global actor or actors. And of course, China, which has already supplanted Russia as a destination for many Central Asian experts and as an investor, um, is a likely candidate for uh, a dominant economic position in the region, but I argue that there are important limits to Beijing uh, the dominant economic role in the region. And those limits are as follows. First, Beijing has always been driven by its own geoeconomic, geostrategic interests. And those interests do not necessarily comport with those of the Central Asian countries. Uh, for example, China is not going to open its borders to Central Asian migrants, and it has always invested very selectively in the energy sector, in other extractive um, industries, mostly in Kazakhstan, in Uzbekistan, and Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan have already been beholden to China that holds a third of this country's public debt. While Central Asian elites may be more willing to open their economies to China, we have also seen public the people showing angst towards Chinese investments. Um, the most recent uh, public protests uh, took place in April in Kazakhstan, just as an example. I think this scenario will also entail Turkish and Western firms entering um, into the region. But I think that the main outcome of this scenario, regardless who the dominant political actor or dominant economic actors would be is the same it will entail the perpetuation of the extractive resource-based economies in the Central Asian countries. Last but not least, um, the scenario that is best for the region and um, which is not entirely unlikely, but very, very difficult to reach is the scenario of regional integration and the backdrop of profound economic reforms. As I already alluded to, this scenario will require very difficult effort aimed at reorienting Central Asian economies from dependence on primary product exports and remittances to more diversified outward oriented economies. It will also require enhanced intra-regional cooperation in the management of infrastructure, in the management of transportation, 
um, you know, border controls and many more. And I think that this scenario can only take place if a Central Asian country, probably Kazakhstan, but also Uzbekistan, will take the leadership role for creating a Central Asian Union without the stewardship of Moscow. But I also think that there are serious obstacles for this scenario. Uh, and those obstacles include not only the lack of proper resources, which will be required um, to bring about this intra-regional integration, there is also a lack of shared vision you know, of how this intra-regional integration will look like. We also have issues with the lagging distrust among the Central Asian governments and also an inability to identify issues that limit current intra-regional cooperation. So I'm hopeful, um, but as I said, um, I think our economic future may land on either one of these three or, um, um, or a feature combination of the elements of this three scenarios. So I'm gonna stop on this note. Um, I think I was within 10 minutes. Yeah, wow. Congratulations, you did. <laughs> uh, 11 minutes, perfect. Uh, was, uh, was really well structured, thanks a lot, because this helps us a lot think about uh, scenarios for the future. And this is laying out three options with a preferable third option of regional integration is really great. Thanks a lot, Maria. Uh, may I invite uh, Lilian Postner as a second speaker? Lilian, you have the floor. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today. And thanks, Maria, for those excellent remarks. Um, I think that um, our remarks will align really well and you've um, set me up to kind of zoom in on some of the things that you've talked about. Um, so I want to start in our conversation about Central Asian migrants by talking about where we're coming from. It's spring 2022. We've just had two years of a really stressful coronavirus pandemic and many migrants who withstood the shocks of the pandemic hoped that this spring would bring some relief and recovery as countries loosened restrictions. Um, but now we're faced with yet another economic downturn that brings with it new restrictions, new travel barriers, new costs and uncertainties um, due to Russia's war with Ukraine and the subsequent sanctions. Um, Central Asian migrants were among the first to lose their jobs in the initial economic contraction. Many who weren't laid off are experiencing delays in payment or don't expect to be paid in full. Um, there's less work to be had, it doesn't pay as well. And because of the devaluation of the ruble, the money migrants do earn doesn't stretch as far. Um, so how to navigate this post-invasion situation? Um, it, do you stay in Russia? Do you go home? Um, and so I think that there are um, some different factors that I'd like to kind of outline to you what might influence someone's decision. Um, if you're a seasonal migrant, can you make the trip this year or the return trip from Russia? If you moved to Russia years ago and built a life there, do you pick up your family and go home or try to ride it out? Um, so I hope to capture some of the factors that might influence this decision, um, right? To, to stay in Russia, to return home, or to very likely take a wait and see approach. Um, many communities in Central Asia, but particularly in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan are hugely remittance dependent. The World Bank, which previously predicted remittances would grow modestly, has um, changed its calculus and now is forecasting that on average, remittances will fall 25%, um, which, is a, which is just a huge amount. In 2020, the first year of the pandemic, so also a big year of economic contraction, remittances um, measured in the, in the billions. Um, so a 25% contraction means less food on the table, less education, less home renovation. This is a really big hit for families to take. Um, if we look at who has gone home so far, Tashkent reported about 133,000 returned migrants from Russia in the first quarter of the year. Dushanbe reported around 60,000, um, which was 2.6 times more than the same period last year. Um, but of the millions of Central Asian migrants in Russia, um, this is, it's not insignificant, but it's not a mass exodus by any means. Um, surveys of migrants from Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan each reported that 40% of them reported that they were planning to return home due to financial difficulties. Um, but 
um, the situation has, you know, has changed a lot since the very beginning of the invasion. We're now eight weeks in, um, so people's calculus in the first two weeks looks probably different than um, it does now. Um, which brings me to my next question, which is, right, so we know that thousands of migrants have left. Um, will others follow suit? Will those who left return? Um, many migrants had already bought plane tickets in preparation to go in for the, the spring construction season. Um, Shirzad Erliev tweeted a few days ago a picture of um, many migrants in Tashkent boarding a plane for Sochi and observed that even though the obstacles to migration have grown, many people are undeterred and are going through with their plans as usual. Um, so while the shock of the initial invasion and sanctions brought some serious disruptions to migration, those disruptions appear to be leveling out somewhat. Um, the value of the ruble, which initially tanked, um, has been strengthened somewhat. Russians have taken measures to try to shore it up. Um, and another good example of that is travel um, between Russia and Central Asia, which in the first weeks of invasion was dramatically disrupted. Airlines canceled flights. Um, flights from Russia that couldn't be insured um, or were leased from Boeing and Airbus, whose planes were recalled. Um, right, air, airfare just took a big hit. There were fewer flights to be had. People didn't know if they would be reimbursed for tickets. Um, some airlines suspended flights altogether. Um, some like Air Astana are not planning to restore them. Um, by the first week of March, the cost of a flight between Moscow and Bishkek jumped as much as 70%, um, which if you're flying back and forth two or three times a year is, is it just puts those tickets out of reach um, for many people. But the situation is starting to level out a little bit. Um, some Russian airlines that initially suspended flights have resumed them, and some smaller central airlines have stepped up to meet demand. Um, the capacity of those flights, we were discussing this um, before, uh, before this webinar, is not, it doesn't match pre-invasion capacity. Um, it also, right, migrants have to share space on these flights with Russians who are fleeing Russia, um, fearing, you know, conscription or a general crackdown. Um, but there are also signs that some of those same Russians who left are trickling back. Um, and it's possible that because the worst fears have not materialized, maybe Central Asian migrants might follow suit. Um, so travel to Russia has become significantly more expensive and logistically complicated, um, but it's still possible. Um, and I think when it's where it's possible, um, migrants will still try to go. Um, the other question that I think is important to ask is, if not Russia, then where? And Maria, you touched on this a little bit, um, that there aren't other great options for Central mig Asian migrants. Um, one option is home, where you have at least a social support network, um, but none of the major migrant sending countries have a social safety net or a labor market robust enough to support millions of returning migrants. And Amali Rahman's announcement to stockpile two years of food in Tajikistan does not instill confidence. Um, Turkey could be an option, right? The Central Asians share some you know, cultural and linguistic ties, but Turkey also cannot absorb um, all of the millions of migrants who depend on Russia for work. Um, and there are a few other contenders, but they're not culturally familiar. Those trails would, trails would have to be blazed basically from scratch. Um, so I think ultimately there are reasons why Russia has been an appealing destination for migrants. And although sanctions dramatically narrow the opportunities there, um, many of those factors remain in place. Um, Ultimately, I think the decision to stay or leave will be made by people's wallets. For some, migration will become untenable if you can't you know, afford the cost of the flight, if you can't find work that justifies being away from your family. Um, for the rest, it will become more arduous. Um, it looks like everyone is going to have to tighten their belts, um, but as long as the path remains open, um, Central Asian migrants will, will take it and make the journey. 
Thanks a lot, Lilian. Um, may I ask you a quick question uh, already, uh, because there's even uh, two minutes left. <laughs> uh, can I ask you about all the stories we, we read about recruitment of Central Asian uh, labor migrants into the Russian armed forces? Uh, do you have any information or views about that? Is that happening on a large scale, do you think? Um, I, um, I'm really glad you asked. Um, I was thinking about including that in this presentation, but I wasn't sure about the scale. Um, I do think that because, um, you know, if anyone is familiar, there was a video of an Uzbek migrant, um, a truck driver who you know, said he was on his way to Ukraine that went viral and caused a lot of stir on social media. And um, I think he was eventually um, found and forced to amend his original video and say that it was not in fact true. But um, his account really captured people's imaginations. So whether or not conscription of Central Asian migrants is a widespread practice, I think fear that it's possible is very palpable and might influence people's calculus. And also because of the narrowing space for um, you know, for work in the formal economy, right, that there's a lot of opportunity for people to be pushed into the informal economy, to be victims of exploitation, and um, for the proliferation of scams that say, you know, pay me a bribe and I'll help keep you out of the Russian military, um, pay me a bribe and I'll help keep you from being deported, um, that it's, it's quite possible that this is a real practice, um, engaged in by the Russian military. Um, I'm not, I, I don't think I have any more information than you do on that, but I think what is important about that is that the possibility strikes fear in people's hearts and they will take measures to fend against that. Great, thanks a lot, Lilian. That gives a bit of a sense of, of, of what is happening uh, there. Great, uh, let's move on to our third speaker, uh, Roman Fakulchuk. Uh, Roman, are you there? Uh, hi again, Jos. Uh, yes, I'm online and I hope you all can hear me. And also I hope you can see my uh, slides. <clears throat> uh, I think it's important that um, these two presentations covered, uh, well, different areas of the impact uh, of the ongoing war in Ukraine. Uh, and my presentation will focus on the, uh, basically the situation with respect to the energy markets and how Central Asia is affected. And I will talk about the, uh, some of the immediate impacts as well as look into the short-term and long-term risks, but also opportunities. Uh, and not to basically lose any time, I will just start straight away uh, presenting the situation concerning uh, the biggest player in terms of energy, Kazakhstan. Uh, so the, just to give you some uh, background information, um, like last year, Kazakhstan exported uh, 68 million of crude oil. Um, and as you can see, those uh, uh, basically uh, millions, they were uh, shipped through different uh, pipelines, most of which actually uh, go through uh, different pipeline routes uh, uh, in Russia. And the, the key pipeline here is, of course, the Caspian Pipeline Consortium where Kazakhstan ships 78% of its crude oil. So if you look at the uh, total uh, uh, shipment and uh, exports of uh, crude oil from Kazakhstan, you will see that in terms of the transportation uh, and using the existing pipelines, Kazakhstan's uh, crude oil uh, very much depends on linkages uh, and pipelines that go through Russia. So more than 90% of uh, crude oil is actually shipped uh, through uh, Russia, which means that uh, one can also talk about Kazakhstan's uh, dependence on the pipeline infrastructure in this regard. Um, in terms of the destination, uh, so the key countries for Kazakhstan are Italy, France, and the Netherlands uh, that get around 45% uh, of the total exports of crude oil from Kazakhstan. And if you look at it from the point of view of uh, uh, European uh, uh, demand, so Kazakhstan basically supplies around 10%. Um, and of course, if you imagine the situation that, for example, this 10% for some reason are cut, this can also be quite a substantial blow to the main economies uh, in uh, Europe. 
And uh, in terms of the immediate effects, uh, uh, by the way, I first have to show you also the, the map that shows um, sort of that all that goes to the left. So basically to the west of uh, Kazakhstan after this uh, blue line. Uh, so it shows the, um, the pipelines that actually cross uh, start in Kazakhstan and then they uh, basically uh, reach different uh, points in Russia uh, with the key uh, harbor in uh, Novorossiysk. So that's the main um, basically uh, city in Russia that um, redirects the uh, oil shipment from Kazakhstan further to Europe. And in terms of the uh, immediate effects, uh, uh, so basically until the end of March, the shipment of uh, Kazakh crude oil uh, was not uh, uh, basically interrupted uh, before uh, the uh, accident happened at some uh, offload platforms in Novorossiysk. Um, and if the official reason is that was because of the heavy storms in that area. But that means that uh, there was the some suspension of uh, crude oil uh, supply to European markets uh, until this uh, basically uh, accident is, is resolved and all the uh, technical issues are fixed. Uh, there has been a quite, you know, quite a substantial, I would say, interruption of supply of uh, Kazakhstan oil to uh, to Europe, and uh, this has already caused some financial losses, um, which are estimated at 1.1 billion. In case uh, this will uh, be basically on a protracted basis, that because there are some scenarios which say that uh, these offload platforms will be repaired. Uh, like in the end of April, some say that uh, they will be repaired in the end of May. And there's also estimates saying that it's likely that those will be fixed only in June, which will result in some also um, substantial costs to uh, the participating oil companies. Um, so and in the case of Kazakhstan, the oil fields such as Karachaganak, Kashagan and uh, Tengiz, they are uh, owned and basically controlled by uh, different companies uh, from the US, from Europe, uh, but also uh, a large share uh, belongs to some of the Russian oil companies, such as Luke Oil, for example. Also, uh, if you look at the um, existing uh, transportation uh, of uh, hydrocarbons from Central Asia, one can already see the uh, rising insurance insurance costs, uh, which means that uh, basically the, the supply uh, of hydrocarbons need to be um, better protected. Uh, and the insuring companies, they uh, uh, charge 10% more, especially when it comes to shipping uh, hydrocarbons through the Black Sea, where you also have these floating mines. Uh, this, this has been an issue in some areas um, and that affects not only the uh, shipment of uh, hydrocarbons, but also the basically some uh, other deliveries of uh, other products and goods in the Black Sea. Uh, at the same time, uh, there's also discussion that uh, Kazakhstan um, is um, joining the working group with Russia uh, to redirect some of the oil uh, uh, through the uh, Tuimazi Omsk Novosibirsk pipeline uh, that uh, starts in uh, Russia and then basically crosses parts of Kazakhstan in the north, uh, which can be redirected and uh, the capacity of which could be expanded uh, and then uh, channeled to China. Um, so this, to some extent, could counterbalance some of the uh, existing losses uh, in terms of the immediate uh, effects. Um, at the same time, I should also say that um, one can, of course, look at this point of view that, um, well, Kazakhstan could possibly redirect some of its uh, uh, oil and gas resources to China. However, as you could see, China, um, well, basically um, holds uh, quite a limited role in terms of the total supply of uh, Kazakhstan fossil fuels. Um, and basically there is an opportunity to expand the capacity by uh, 50%, uh, but the total volume would be just 20 uh, million of crude oil. And this compared again to the uh, more than 65%, uh, 65 million of oil that is shipped to Europe is quite a, still quite a big difference. Um, and also there is some ongoing uh, you know, disputes between uh, Kazakhstan and China, which I don't think also help or like facilitate finding new solutions for diversifying energy exports from Kazakhstan. Uh, and one example is this cargo dispute, uh, um, meaning that more than 1,300 containers that, uh, coming from Kazakhstan have been basically blocked uh, at the border with China. Um, and uh, part of it also uh, some raw materials, but also some other products. And uh, uh, well, uh, Beijing uh, says that it's largely for the reason of uh, ongoing conflict, but also that 
it, uh, you know, uh, for example, when it comes to food products, uh, which are also in these containers, then uh, um, Chinese authorities say that, well, it's basically doesn't satisfy all the safety standards. So this is not really helpful, uh, given them in the uh, existing context. Uh, plus, also, uh, if you look at uh, basically Kazakhstan, you will see that the uh, logistics infrastructure for energy diversification is quite limited. Also, in terms of the, you know, for example, the number of tankers that Kazakhstan has, also in terms of the available uh, containers that could be used for en uh, energy experts, for example, to, uh, for example, to use railways for delivering uh, some of the crude oil to China. So Kazakhstan also has very limited uh, basically number of containers that it could use for that. Uh, at the same time, uh, another looming uh, risk for uh, basically the situation uh, in the short term perspective is of course, the state of uh, China-Russia energy relations. Uh, because there are some scenarios which say that uh, it's likely that uh, in light of the um, energy sanctions, Russia might expand its collaboration with China. Uh, and this of course could mean that, uh, well, Russia could basically supply China with natural gas and oil, um, and maybe uh, in, a, in a way that would be maybe more attractive for the Chinese market so that China could actually reorient towards Russia more in terms of the energy supplies in the near future, which could of course result in some potential losses for Kazakhstan, but also for Turkmenistan, uh, which has the uh, large uh, natural gas pipeline uh, uh, to China. So far, the natural gas exports has not been really uh, affected, but it's still possible, depending and again on how uh, China-Russia energy relations would play out. And also then we know that in terms of the risks for the entire region, including uh, Tajikistan and also uh, including Kyrgyzstan, there is a risk of new accidents. Uh, the one that happened in January, uh, you know, when uh, there was basically black blackout uh, for different reasons for the excessive use of the existing electricity grid, and all the issues related to the aging infrastructure, of course, also uh, complicate uh, the situation with energy security in the region. Um, another very important uh, risk factor here is that uh, there's a lot of discussion and uh, rhetorical support that Central Asia should decarbonize. Uh, but in our recent studies, we found that actually, if you look at the consumption of fossil fuels and also the exports of fossil fuels from Central Asia, they have been actually increasing. Uh, and the plans for the next five years also show, like the projections show that Kazakhstan uh, also, as well as uh, Kyrgyzstan, they plan actually to expand the exports of coal. Um, and the same is actually the concerning the use of coal uh, for different purposes. Um, so it means that uh, at the same time, um, many countries in the regions like Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, they announced carbon neutrality by 2060. But this contradicts a bit with more you know, uh, in, in intermediate plans, so like the energy agenda until 2030, at least as it looks now uh, in the in the region, uh, uh, is very much focused on actually continue the expansion of uh, fossil fuels use. Um, and the although there's so much discussion of the prospects of renewables, you still see that like in Kazakhstan, 70% of electricity is still very much based on the coal uh, consumption. Uh, and with this, we also see that there is very little investment in low carbon technologies. Um, plus, of course, we should also mention one uh, often underestimated factor here is that uh, Central Asia is criticized for, you know, promoting uh, fossil fuels, but often this is also, I think, uh, this uh, agenda is imposed by external actors. As you can see, like China, 99% uh, of Chinese energy investment, they actually ended up being in the uh, fossil fuel sector. And of course, China expects a return on investment and the use of this for example, oil and uh, gas platforms, uh, pipelines, uh, as well as the, the, you know, the production and the exploration of new oil fields with a view to keep on uh, you know, producing it for the next 15, 20 years. So, I mean, this also potentially contradicts the plans for reaching carbon neutrality. Also, we know that the European Union uh, has been constantly calling Central Asia to decarbonize. And there are numerous uh, projects, uh, programs for facilitating capacity building among the governments in Central Asia on the benefits of uh, you know, shifting to renewable energy. But at the same time, uh, you also have European energy companies that keep on expanding their investment in oil and gas in Central Asia. So there's quite a big mismatch in terms of, for example, the official EU uh, proposal for the region and also what the actually European companies do in the region. 
Uh, another problem also that many of the other partners still see Central Asia as a source of hydrocarbons. So that was basically the risk part. Now let's look a bit at the opportunities. And here I should say that um, uh, the situation for Central Asia, as it looks now in terms of the ongoing conflict in Ukraine, is that, um, well, I, I think that hydrocarbon exports can benefit Central Asia in the short term, especially Omar, high, yes, uh, one minute, uh, okay? yeah, especially given the high oil prices. But in the long term perspective, uh, this can be quite harming if, if Central Asia is not really joining the energy transition. Uh, and there's, of course, also the risk from the Europe uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism uh, under which actually Kazakhstan could be most uh, affected. Uh, and it would be also it could also complicate the trade between Kazakhstan and other countries. Uh, so it's very important to look at renewable energy because it can also partly solve some of the labor migration issues. Uh, as we know, renewable energy actually requires 20, 30% more of labor for the producing, for example, of one gigawatt of energy compared to fossil fuels. And actually Central Asia has also very important um, uh, endowment with uh, mineral reserves that can be used for the energy transition. So, uh, and now today, especially with, again, with the situation on uh, uh, raw markets, we see that, uh, well, um, for example, the prices for nickel, for copper, they skyrocket. Uh, and if you look at the, reserves in Central Asia, you can see that actually the region holds a lot of different minerals that could be used for energy transition. So it means that this is an area where Central Asia can be playing an, uh, quite an important role. Uh, and in terms of the key actors, actually China has been uh, heavily expanding its ex, uh, imports of these minerals from Central Asia for over the last five years. Uh, and these minerals are used for the purpose of uh, building uh, solar panels and wind turbines. Uh, but China is actually the only actor that realizes this potential of Central Asia. So in terms of conclusion, uh, I think that the uncertainty for energy markets will continue growing and the protracted war will actually multiply energy security risks for the region. Uh, there's an urgent need to diversify energy infrastructure, but also energy partners. Uh, as I presented in the beginning, there's uh, quite a high degree of dependence, for example, on the Russian uh, transportation links. And also, also urgent need to diversify the economy and sources of revenue. Um, so again, I think more than uh, before, this is quite a, uh, an, an important need for the region. And I think it's already getting too late to decarbonize the economies in Central Asia. So it's really time to join the race for energy transition. Also, given that many scholars say that actually the, the war in Ukraine is in many ways accelerating the global energy transition. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Roman, and uh, thanks for uh, bringing some uh, clarity in this extremely difficult issue. Uh, I see a lot of questions coming in, and uh, because we are now on topic, I would ask Paul Dunay to wait a few moments and that we ask Roman maybe to already uh, look into a few questions. Roman, may I ask you? Uh, I have one question here. Uh, why just 1% of Kazakh oil exports to China is not a pipeline in full capacity? The same uh, person asks also, before considering a route through Novo Sibirsk, would it be possible for Kazakhstan to increase exports through the existing direct pipeline? I uh, are these questions you could already look into, Roman? Uh, yeah, I can uh, quickly follow up on those. Uh, regarding the first question, uh, yes, actually the existing oil pipeline to China is used uh, only at 45% capacity. Um, but in order to increase the capacity, uh, um, many of the parts of the pipeline need uh, some reconstruction. Um, because, I mean, the pipeline itself has quite limited capacity. And so in order to be able to expand it and to increase the volume, uh, some really uh, difficult technical solutions are needed. And I know that the, uh, the government in Kazakhstan is discussing to maybe, you know, inviting international um, engineers to try to help to actually find a technical and quick solution to solve it. Uh, but still, like, even if it's used at the full capacity, like 100%, it would still be just 25% of what Kazakhstan actually ships to Europe. And the second question, I'm not quite sure what is meant by the existing direct pipeline, um, but at least uh, when I mentioned this uh, working group between China, uh, between Kazakhstan and Russia, uh, uh, I think this is now in very much in discussion in order to you know, compensate some of the losses 
uh, on the part of the uh, Russia, which is under sanctions, and also Kazakhstan because of the, as I said, the some of the uh, limits to shipment of oil uh, through Novara port. Okay, great, Roman. And then also a last question uh, from uh, Larissa Ulpina. Uh, what is in your opinion? Uh, what is your opinion on whether it is in Central Asia's best interest to be a raw material base? Uh, I think that by uh, basically shifting the focus from exports of hydrocarbons to uh, the to focus more on raw materials such as, as I said before, like uh, copper, cobalt, nickel, uh, lithium, uh, Central Asia, uh, first of all, can compensate for the losses in uh, hydrocarbon exports, because, for example, the price for lithium has increased by 400% last year. And in terms of the economic value, you could already see that the exports of raw materials needed for energy transition, uh, they already, you know, um, be becoming more valuable. And uh, also there's, uh, there's financial gains from actually shifting to this area. And the second uh, point here is also the reputation uh, that by basically helping the global energy transition, Central Asia could be seen as having a, like a, let's say a green profile and maybe also can, can actually change its um, st status of being a hub for hydrocarbon expert, basically. Great, thanks a lot, Roman. And more questions are pouring in, so uh, I think you have to get back to work later on. Uh, thanks a lot, Roman. And uh, so from economy, we move to social issues, we move to energy, and we end up with security issues. Uh, Paul Dunay, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Jos, uh, and I, I'm very glad to be here and I envy all the other panelists who spoke about something concrete, uh, whereas I have to speak about something which is far less tangible. Uh, let me start by saying that if relative power distribution in the international system is recognized, then probably the Russian Federation in the last few years actually strengthened its position in the post-Soviet space, except for a few countries which are actually lost by the Russian Federation, which certainly include Ukraine, Georgia, and to some extent, uh, Moldova. Uh, but things did not start on the 24th of February. Things started much earlier. And let me now list four elements which underline why I think that the Russian Federation's position until the 24th of February uh, strengthened in the region. And I take them in sequence. The first one is the further weakening of Belarus following the 9th of August 2020 elections, uh, which resulted in full dependence of Alexander Lukashenko on the Russian Federation. Of course, there is an old joke uh, in the 1980s, we had a joke in Budapest which asked the question, uh, which country is the least imperialistic country in the world? And the answer, of course, was it was Afghanistan. And the reason that Afghanistan does not even interfere in its domestic affairs, in its own domestic affairs. And now the same applies to Belarus. Belarus is not even interfering with its own affairs. It's uh, outsourced. The second one is Russia's essential contribution to peace in the South Caucasus, which resulted in Armenia's full dependence on Russian benevolence due to ceasefire and Russian peacekeepers. However, and let me make one prediction here, this will still not prevent Azerbaijan from taking back the rest of Nagorno-Karabakh and create a new territorial status quo. This may mean the political end of Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan, uh, which is actually something that the Russian Federation would warmly welcome, although would not speak about it. The third one is the meltdown in Afghanistan, which is unwelcome for both Russia and China. But with the securitization of politics in Central Asia, Russia's dominance increased. Exercises have been held with Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Uzbekistan. And there was more perceived reliance on Russia, both in the CSTO by uh, the Tajiks and the Kyrgyz and bilaterally by the Uzbeks, who are inching in the direction, but I don't think that they are going to get in 
uh, I don't want to make too many uh, politically incorrect jokes, but I have to admit that possibly uh, marrying the same person for the third time, and that's of course Uzbekistan and the, and the CSTO would be a, a, a fateful thing. The fourth one is the first employment of the CSTO in a domestic contingency, which was falsely portrayed as having some international relevance and diplomatically and cleverly not identified with any state by the Kazakh president, Kazim Shomar Tokayev. A new model is in the making, domestic development portrayed as international to legitimize CSTO interference. And Armenia, the country that definitely did not like the CSTO interference in the beginning of January and was in charge of the CSTO, uh, knew precisely the limits of its freedom of action and played along. Uh, if only great power matters, as Vladimir Putin emphasized this already once in 2007 and once in 2021, the shorter one, I don't want to waste your time, was if I want to speak to Warsaw, I speak to Washington. And of course, I could uh, have the quotes concerning Zelensky. Uh, as a consequence, uh, in this case, it's very clear that then Central Asia is more of an appendage than anything else. Uh, each and every Central Asian state relies on vectoral foreign policy, although their level of international engagement varies. And of course, uh, we should just take, take Turkmenistan out uh, because of its positive neutrality. Uh, it's, there is no change expected, although Moscow tries to open a new chapter of harmonious relations under Serdar Berdi Mohamedov uh, with uh, Turkmenistan. Uh, so what I see is the continuation of vector foreign policy. And of course, the question is how the vectors are going to rearrange in light of the uh, events that started or unfolded on the 24th of uh, February. And there is, to tell the truth, no end in sight. Uh, the UN General Assembly, three countries abstained and two were absent from voting. Uh, on the condemnation of the Russian action in uh, Ukraine. And of course, in this case, this was much closer to China's position than to uh, the position of either the West or uh, the Russian Federation. Russia and four other countries, of course, voted against. It was the, the famous five consisting of Belarus, Russia, Eritrea, the DPRK and Syria, and if you have such friends, you don't need enemies. Uh, and of course, Russia is playing active diplomacy uh, in order to help regime survival. And a variety of statements have been made and they all indicated variations. Uh, the understanding of the Russian, foreign pos Russian position was expressed by President Japarov and President Mirziyoyev uh, and I have to admit that President Mirziyoyev is uh, doing very well in the sense that uh, Russia, ever since uh, the late September 2016 meeting with President Mirziyoyev and Putin in uh, Samarkand, the relations are extremely skillfully managed by both uh, parties. The Uzbek Foreign Minister Kamilov said the respect for territorial integrity of Ukraine and no recognition for the DNR, LNR. Uh, and of course, uh, keeping the non-block status and strengthening relations with Russia. So we had every kind of variations. And of course, uh, the, the on Padrobna Uz, uh, you found Mr. Ergashev's uh, comments that I quote, the Central Asia space is neighboring three existing or emerging global power centers Russia, China, India, and is also influenced by a fourth. The US and the collective West is becoming an area of tough uh, confrontation. I think this is very far from reality. And why I disagree is what I call a negative grade game. In Central Asia, we still uh, notice a negative grade game where very few countries want to engage with the area. Uh, of course, Russia and China, as a consequence, remain the two main vectors. 
because the Western presence due to the presence of China and Russia is uh, simply due to that in order to avoid falling the countries of Central Asia fully in the arms of China and Russia that I think is not going to be a successful attempt. What we see in case of the Russian behavior with Ukraine is actually a tragedy as far as grand strategy, and that tragedy was caused by one single person who had a totally irrelevant and unrealistic idea. However, the military strategy, although it is increasingly showing signs of horror and occasionally genocide uh, or genocidal behavior, uh, is trying to fix what the grand strategy made wrong. And we still don't know what the outcome is going to be because the parties continue to hedge. Uh, and of course, I think that we, the Russian, that the Central Asian states will try to avoid massive losses due to dependence on the Russian economy. Uh, at the same time, they also will have to count with China's relative weakness. And as a consequence, uh, that will not necessarily be so flourishing, including, of course, infrastructural links where we see that the BRI is going to suffer from the entire uh, situation on land, at least. So we are going to see the land uh, connection uh, weakening and being less uh, attractive, not to mention if China is growing even less than it planned, the 5.5% that the Chinese economy was planning to grow, which, is a, which would be lovely for most of our countries, but is not lovely for the Chinese. If it is going further down somewhere, they will have to spare money. Already a part of the industry is short of energy and is not doing too well. Uh, fortunately, the Chinese leadership, very realistically, is not making the population suffer, but makes the industry suffer. But of course, that has a spillover effect. And uh, I'm getting very close to the end. Uh, the information space, the influence on the population in Central Asia continues to be decisively Russian. The only country in the post-Soviet space which is out of this kind of Russian dependency in, in the information space is Georgia. Uh, no other country is fully absent of influence. At the same time, the local authorities are doing some interesting things which qualify the information space uh, based on Russian information. Uzbekistan is using UN data on the war, which is very interesting. Uh, and of course, if any of the Central Asian states would like to change the balance of vectors in their foreign policy, they will have to address the information space. And let me say that there are two uh, issues here, one of them that these countries in some variation will remain with the current vectors as the West is not presenting a viable and sufficiently intensive alternative. And the geoeconomical emphasis shall or ought to characterize the Central Asian state's interests in the years to come. And let me quote something that uh, I just read today from Karolina Kluczewska who was just traveling in Tajikistan when the war started in uh, Uzbekistan. And it was uh, very interesting what, what she got from somebody in Dushanbe. And she said, or she quotes, because of the decision of one person, the West is punishing all Russians and with them also us. In this war, the West is using different means from Russia, economic rather than military. But I do not see much difference between these two sides. Both are cruel because they make millions of people suffer. So it is apparent that what we see in the, in the European information space is very far from the information space that is getting projected to Central Asia. And as a consequence, uh, the leadership, as much as the leaders do not want to uh, diverge from the, from the population, uh, we'll have to cope with the fact that the people see this conflict differently than, than we do in, 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 in Europe. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Paul. And um, uh, th that was a very clear message uh, that uh, Russia is definitely not gone from, uh, from this region and is here to stay. Uh, thanks a lot for this. Uh,
I propose that we uh, do two or three uh, rounds of questions. Um, and I would like to start with the following questions. Um, there was in the beginning one question which was uh, asked to all four speakers. Uh, and that also uh, relates to the last question that was asked. Please let, them re let me read them to you. So first, uh, Putin's regime is an umbrella for all the autocracies in uh, the former Soviet space. Will the positions of autocratic leaders be shaken if Putin is defeated? Asks Marat Mamdusheev. And uh, the last question that was asked um, by Nadezhda Tatkalo is, is there a high possibility that negative consequences of Russia's war in Ukraine in terms of deterioration of socioeconomic situation in Central Asia results in a strengthening of authoritarian tendencies in the region? So these are tw two questions that are rather linked. Then uh, maybe also this was, I think, a question uh, directed to Roman, but maybe uh, several of you would like to comment on this. Um, is there any climate uh, uh, threat impact towards Central Asia due to the uses of energy? So, and that's also a bit linked to uh, changing to from uh, carbons to other sources of energy. And can the current conflicts uh, relate to that? Let's start with that, and then I'll assemble uh, a few of the other questions. Um, can I start with you, Maria? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. I'll be very brief. So one of the strong findings um, that comes from comparative politics literature is something like this. So economic development does not suffice to bring about democratization. But economic decline, however, is one of the major threats to democracy, especially kind of a countries in transition towards democracy. So I am a strong believer that um, um, sanctions, um, you know, the, the detrimental economic consequences and the war in Ukraine um, and, and, and uh, weaknesses or challenges of the Putin regime uh, will have not a direct uh, but indirect impact on um, strengthened authoritarianism in Central Asia. I don't think um, that if the regime comes down, we'll have some kind of um, a positive impact in the sense that it's going to show the flaws of autocracy, um, because I don't think that authoritarianism is um, generated from without. Um, authoritarianism is genera generated from within. There are lots of um, sources, domestic sources of authoritarianism, the factors that sustain, maintain it. Um, so the fall of the Putin regimes will not suffice to bring authoritarianism down. But as I said, um, usually when authoritarian governments face challenges to their legitimacy, and we have just witnessed this in the past years, um, when uh, the ways that kind of the toolkit that the authoritarian regimes um, use is shared. Um, so when COVID hit and the government's legitimacy was in question because it um, unearthed um, the, the weaknesses of the health system and just government lack of capacity um, to deal with the crisis. So the government really clamped down on the freedom of information. They resorted to all kinds of elaborate surveillance mechanisms purportedly to ensure citizens compliance with um, various kinds of um, um, sanitary regimes. So, um, and I think this is something that is gonna happen as um, we see the consequences of this economic crisis that to shield um, themselves from any kind of public criticisms the governments are going to clamp down on informational freedoms and the freedoms of you know, holding opposition uh, uh, demonstrations um, on any kind of dissent. So again, this is just um, uh, a few examples of how I think um, it, the economic situation um, will shape the future of these authoritarian regimes. Great, thanks a lot, Maria. Uh, Lilian, would you like to comment as well? Um, I think that was um, it was a, a really good sort of summary. Um, one thing that I would add is that um, 
right? That Central Asia has, you know, there are existing tensions that have been at play for a long time that are, that could very easily be exacerbated with people are hungry if more migrants are returning home, um, that, that, that could be exacerbated by economic distress, things like, um, you know, Xenoosian style protests that precipitated the January in Western Kazakhstan or tensions on the Tajik Kyrgyz border, that those things could take on greater, um, greater significance um, if people are, are home and hungry. Um, but I agree with Maria that um, Central Asian governments have displayed a willingness to crack down. And um, I think that we'll probably see more of that should those tensions flare. Great, thanks a lot, Lilian. Uh, Roman, the floor. Uh, yeah, so thank you, Jos. Uh, I think addressing the question concerning the impact of climate change on Central Asia. Um, well, the first thing is that Central Asia itself as a region is uh, quite a small contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, uh, if you compare it at the global scale. Um, so um, it's actually in the group of the least um, uh, emitting uh, regions in the world. Um, however, Central Asia is one of the most exposed regions to climate change, um, facing the, the threat of um, increasing temperature, which is actually uh, above the global average. Um, and this already results in, in uh, increasing desertification uh, of uh, actually straining water resources. Um, uh, also, we know that about the um, melting glaciers that affect um, this Central Asia. So in that sense, Central Asia actually uh, is facing the consequences of the actually global emissions. Um, and of, of course, you could ask which countries to blame. And of course, that's the biggest emitters in the world. Um, so, and it's not, not only Central Asia, but also Africa is highly exposed, although Africa, for example, is a very small contributor as well. Um, however, if you look at the situation uh, at the local level, I would still say that uh, the use of uh, fossil fuel resor uh, resources in Central Asia can also has a lot of negative implications for health, for the environment. Uh, well, we know that, for example, uh, every winter, Bishkek uh, is considered as one of the most polluted cities in the world. Actually, last year in 2021, uh, Kyrgyzstan was ranked number one during some periods, according to the World uh, uh, quality, Air Quality Index. And this is because of the burning of coal for heating. Um, and also, I mean, in terms of if you look at the environmental harm that is done through the um, combustion of um, coal factories. So it's, it's quite, I would say, quite visible uh, in Central Asia itself. Um, so, uh, so it's kind of, you know, this has two different, uh, the situation has two different uh, faces. Uh, but the fact that Central Asia keeps on, you know, expanding its hydrocarbon exports to other markets also means that, yeah, basically Central Asia contributes to um, to the global consumption of fossil fuels. Thanks a lot, Roman. Uh, Paul, would you like to comment? Thank you. Uh, it's uh, first of all, it depends how Vladimir Putin loses. Vladimir Putin compared to his aspiration of the 21st, 22nd, and 24th of February, has already lost this war. In the sense that he's not going to be able to control the entire territory of Ukraine. And of course, he had to wake up to reality that he expected uh, the soldiers uh, provided by three, for, by three days of, of food rations uh, to be welcomed by flowers and, and smiles of Ukrainian, uh, usually very good looking women. That's the third politically incorrect statement for today. Uh, and it did not happen. And as a consequence, in that sense, he lost. He will not be able to gain Ukraine. Not to mention, I think uh, one day in history, this will have to be taught how to lose a country. Ukraine was very close. Uh, socially and in many other senses to, to uh, the Russian Federation until 2013 and simply the wrong strategy that Russia has pursued resulted in a situation that now Ukraine is a country which is much alienated by the Russian Federation and is not going to get back to it. 
Now, the question is what peace? And I think the current operations are about nothing else than what kind of peace can be achieved. Uh, can it result in a loss of territory of Ukraine, both in its south and in its southeast? Or can Ukraine retain, not to mention eventually regain, its territorial integrity? These are the things you, you see Zelensky is ready for compromise and walking backwards. Uh, the Russian side is, is, is playing games. Of course, they do not want uh, Vladimir Putin to sit down with the Zelensky and negotiate because probably he's not in a realistically good shape for that. Uh, as a consequence, they want to have everything pre-cooked, just a meeting of, of the presidents to sign the documents like, like Yanukovych and Medvedev, the Kharkiv Agreement in 2010, if you, you visually remember uh, how, it, how it happened. Uh, so, and the next question that we don't know who will take the place of Vladimir Vladimirovich if this happens, uh, is there the securitocracy winning? Is it the, the Patrushevs, the Bortnikovs, the Narishkins, uh, the Medvedevs, who is increasingly behaving in a very odd manner and loses every kind of respect that he ever enjoyed among liberal uh, European circles? Or will it be the pragmatic people, the Sobyanins, the Mishustins, the president of the National Bank who try to sail and navigate? That's, that's a very big, big question. I think the Central Asian authoritarian regimes cannot be identified the five as one. Uh, we have to make a little bit of a difference. I think authoritarian regimes only lose when they are overusing the oppressive means and underutilizing the chance to bring people on board. As of now, I see that most of the Central Asian regimes are successfully bringing the people on board. Uh, this definitely applies to Kazim Jomar Tokayev, who certainly did not want to be seen as somebody with blood on his hands. Uh, and that's what he's doing ever since the 13th of January, he's trying to engage the society and create a better image. Uh, uh, President Mirziyoyev has one enormous advantage that everybody remembers his predecessor. And as a consequence, he has to deliver relatively little in order to be recognized. Uh, I have to admit that as much as I know Central Asia and as much as I was traveling in all the five, uh, Uzbekistan, under uh, Islam Karimov was a worse regime than Gurban Guliberdi Mohamedov's Turkmenistan. Uh, and uh, that's, that's something which is already sad enough. Now, of course, Kyrgyzstan is the big question. In Kyrgyzstan, they had two and a half revolutions and uh, the people are totally disenchanted what they have done. And there is no reason not to be disenchanted. Will it bring them to the barricade? Or will they come to the conclusion that there is no point because whenever we, we resist, we have a revolution and then a temporary upswing and then everything gets much worse. You may remember, I, I went to uh, Bishkek not much after uh, Bakiev took over, everybody was enthusiastic. And a year later, I went back to Bishkek and everybody was deeply disappointed. Uh, and of course, we must not underestimate the fact that it's very difficult to get rid of the Putin regime. Uh, so the assumption that the Putin regime would go and then it would have uh, spillover repercussions. Vladimir Putin is not Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev, who let his opponents assemble in the sauna and agree upon his replacement by Leonid Ilyich Brezhnev. Uh, that's absolutely out. Everybody is monitored. Everybody has dirt on his hand, financial or other. And of course, nobody trusts anybody. As a consequence, it would be not impossible, but an extremely difficult exercise to get beyond the Putin regime without having a Putin regime. Eventually, without Putin, I am living in the south of Germany, so I can say, uh, which you may like, that what we are looking is the July 20, 1944 solution, fascism without Hitler. 
Putinism without Putin, but it is a very difficult uh, and uh, and a very difficult thing, and it requires lots of imagination to to imagine that they are not going to turn the table around and present the partial result as a partial success in order to maintain the stability of the leadership. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, there are a lot of questions. Uh, I propose we do the following. I have one uh, specific question uh, for Lilian. Uh, I will ask her to answer this question. After that, I will read out a few questions and ask the speakers to uh, comment on the questions they would like to answer and also uh, conclude with some uh, concluding words. Uh, but first, a question uh, for you, Lilian, from Victoria Nem. Uh, as Russia, uh, as the Russian economy continues to deteriorate, do we expect a rise in inter-ethnic tensions, especially towards labor migrants in Central Asia, from Central Asia in Russia? Early this year, there was this rhetoric of ethnic enclaves possibly forming in Russia and posing danger to society. Would Russia take advantage to further restrict labor migration? Lilian, please. Um, uh, thanks for the question. Um, so I think as the economy contracts, whenever people perceive scarcity, they're willing to take more dramatic measures to ensure that they have what they need. So um, for example, I can very easily imagine a scenario where Russian police officers who aren't getting paid as much as they used to have to collect more bribes from Central Asian migrants in the metro, for example. And all of those little things when people are, are hungry and scared really add up when people have their dignity trampled upon. Um, so I, I think that it's quite possible to have a rise in inter-ethnic tensions. I also think that many Russian officials, particularly at the local level, are, um, are very good opportunists a lot of the time. And if they see political gain to be made in vilifying Central Asian migrants. It's in their interests to take it. Um, I don't have any specific examples that come immediately to mind. Um, just right that the, the conditions that migrants face now are tighter than they were pre-invasion, but they're not radically different. Um, that right, many people, you know, don't have documents or can't rely on their documents. And all of that you know, creates room for exploitation and tensions to rise um, that might not occur if the economy was flourishing. So I think it's, it's possible, um, but hopefully I'm wrong about that. Okay, thanks a lot, Lilian. Uh, I will read out a few questions um, for the panel to look into and also conclude with some final words. Uh, first, a question from Alisher. Uh, there is noticeably less currency in Central Asia now, in particular in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. It is becoming increasingly difficult to exchange local currencies for dollars and euros. Yes, there are obvious economic reasons that explain this. However, can we assume that these countries following the aspirations of Moscow are also artificially increasing the scale of the currency deficit in order, let's say, to teach people to live without the US dollar and the euro. Then there is a question from Gulzada Rizbekova. Uh, besides the economy, what challenges uh, Central Asian region would face in the current situation with Ukraine? So she asked the uh, speakers to think a bit out of the box what other challenges are there besides economy and security what have we not been discussing yet um, then there is a question from elita bakirova uh, how do you see the future of nato in relationship to central asia how will NATO also think about other rising uh, powers, formerly China and India? Um, and 
there is a question, fine, uh, this one we have already. I will leave it with this. My apologies to all the people that have asked questions uh, and have, I have not mentioned them. Well, maybe one last question from uh, Lucas Carroll. Uh, Russia has border disputes with Kazakhstan. Given the current situation and Russian troops under the CSTO in Kazakhstan at the beginning of January this year, it is likely that Russia's regime will actively show the West that Russia has control over its near abroad. Many Kazakh citizens are afraid of aggression coming from the Russian regime. Maybe some of the speakers would like to comment on that. Uh, that's a quite big number of questions. Uh, please pick one or two issues and briefly comment on those. Maria, can I start again with you? Sure. So I'm going to take the question from Gonzada about um, non-economic challenges. So I would just point out two of those. I'll, I'll quickly talk about um, an Islamic vector and a social vector. Um, I'm one of those who've been very, very careful to not overinflate um, the Islamist threat in Central Asia. I'm also one of those who's been very careful not to um, draw uh, linkages between poverty um, and radical Islam or poverty and terrorism. However, I think um, the Islamic vector will become more prominent in Central Asia for a number of reasons. A, you know, we've seen the return of foreign fighters, but more importantly, we're seeing a repatriation of, um, you know, the wives um, and children of foreign fighters. Kazakhstan in particular has launched a number of programs, but there are various varied assessments of how successful those programs have been. So some, and in Uzbekistan has done so, so as well, but hasn't really advertised much the outcome of those programs. Um, I think, um, you know, the countries have needed an alternative to both Eastern vector to China and Russian vector and Islam has provided such an alternative um, with, with, you know, again, Kazakhstan is a, is a great example. We've, we've seen people in um, Nazarbayev's um, inner circle or, or um, you know, in the family kind of leaning towards that, you know, um, Islamist parties that are banned, but nevertheless, there are some kind of advancements um, in that realm. And of course, you know, again, economy is not a factor in the rise of Islamist sentiments, but however, I think it can trigger some of those psychological processes, um, um, disillusionment with the situation, et cetera, et cetera, that may push or make some people more vulnerable to recruitment in um, the extremist groups. And let me just say a few words about social uh, vector. Um, I think um, if in case of Ukraine, war has um, united people, obviously around the cause of fighting Russia's aggression, I think we will witness more social fragmentation in Central Asia that I'm worried about. Why? Because a lot of phenomena in Central Asia to include corruption and crime, um, they have ethnic dimensions. Ethnic dimension is not the only dimension, but there is uh, an ethnic dimension to a lot of phenomena. And as we see, we see scarcity of resources, which means um, limited and more heightened competition over the access to rents and so on and so forth. I think um, all of this is going to kind of amplify the pre-existing ethnic cleavages, cleavages. And as we will see more uh, labor migrants returning and probably seeking um, employment in other countries in Central Asia to include Kazakhstan, I think all that will also trigger some of those um, um, ethnic sentiments. And we should also keep an eye on um, the nationalist sentiments, rising nationalism in Central Asia. So um, Islamic vector, nationalist vector, you know, social vector. Thanks a lot. That's uh, three more seminars uh, following. Uh, great. Uh, Lilian, uh, would you like uh, to answer one or two of the questions? Uh, sure, I'd like to tackle um, the question about Russia and Kazakhstan um, and right, are Kazakhstan citizens um, afraid of Russian aggression? Um, so I guess the, the first point that I would like to make about Russia's CSTO presence in Kazakhstan um, is that it got to sort of thumb its nose at the West, right? Anthony Blinken said, you know, once Russian troops arrive, they never leave and they left, you know, very quickly. Um, and I think that was a signal to the West that, right, you don't, right, you don't know us, wait, we have friendly relations, we're not just um, imperial bad guys, whether or not that's true, that was the message. If I lived in Kazakhstan, I would be 
alarmed at some of the rhetoric coming from Russian officials about Kazakhstan. Um, right, that that northern Kazakhstan belongs to Russia, that Kazakhstan statehood is not legitimate. Um, it's unclear to me how widely that belief is held, but again, that's something that could be capitalized upon. Um, I don't think that Russia is really in the mood to open up another, another front, another conflict, as it is not doing well in the war with Ukraine. Um, but if they needed an easy victory, it's it's happened before where you, you know, you try to grab land where you can. Um, if that were to happen, I don't know that Kazakhstan would be my first choice. So I guess my ultimate takeaway is that I would be nervous if I lived in Kazakhstan and I would reconsider um, throwing my whole law in with Russia. But I, but there are a lot of reasons as we've talked about why it's good to have a strong relationship with Russia. So taking that middle stance, which I think the Kazakhstani government is of um, not being too friendly or too cold is, is um, takes that into consideration. Great, thanks a lot, Lilian. Uh, Roman, please. Uh, yeah, um, as a note of conclusion, I would probably say that uh, given this whole situation and um, quite a challenging geopolitical um, uncertainty, uh, I would say that uh, that's probably more than ever, the uh, regional collaboration in Central Asia is very much needed. Um, I think basically to solve all those issues and problems we discussed, starting from the economy, uh, labor migration, and then also the energy and all other issues, social, you know, social crisis. This all, I think, can be uh, tackled in a more effective way if there's more collaboration and more, you know, joint discussion among Central Asian leaders, uh, but also not only leaders, but uh, at the level of, you know, uh, collaboration between NGOs as well as private sector um, partners uh, in the region. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, Roman. Paul. Oh, it's a, thank you so much. It's a lot. Uh, three or four short comments. The first one is uh, where I see problems in the future is one of them, which is a constant headache, I think, is losing uh, the language of any major large country, be it Russia, be it China. So losing Russian without gaining Chinese or English or something. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, there is going to be a, a lasting decline in the labor force, which will be losing its competitiveness in many Central Asian states. And I think it will uh, contribute to the continuation of a very uh, little competitive picture. The second one is on NATO. Uh, I think NATO is going to hold a summit in the very end of June. Uh, the big question is uh, whether we will be, whether the language will change as far as the assessment of China. Currently, as if uh, you probably all remember, the June uh, 14, 2021 summit agreed that China was a systemic challenger and that Russia was more an adversary. Will we be ready to change this or are we going to stay with this? My guess that we are going to stay with this and we are not going to extrapolate the challenge that China uh, presents uh, for the West. Uh, India, I think, uh, is a very mixed picture, of course, now, because the West is so unhappy with India's behavior on buying oil and so on and so forth. Uh, but India, we need badly for China. <laughs> so we are not going to change our behavior uh, with respect to India. The third one is the, the Ukraine war creates division lines between Russia and China, because of course, uh, China is a country that respects territorial integrity of countries, as all the territorial integrity problems are internal for China, i.e. Taiwan. Uh, as a consequence, this would separate China and Russia. At the same time, there is one element that holds China and Russia together, and that's the rejection of the unipolar international order. And of course, uh, it seems as of now that the second is stronger than the former. 
The former was how it started at the Munich Security Conference, the Chinese foreign minister speaking about the territorial integrity and sovereignty of countries, including Ukraine, quite importantly. And now we see that the Russians sort of convinced the Chinese that the entire game is not about Ukraine, it's about the unipolar international order, which is, of course, identified primarily with the United States. And the last one is the quick departure. Uh, we should remember that Nikol Pashinyan was of the view that this will be a short term uh, activity. And then, of course, Kazim Jomar Tokayev uh, was most interested not to uh, have a Russian occupation for a long time on the territory of, of Kazakhstan. And uh, the Russians at the same time were also already preparing. Mishustin openly said that they were preparing for this war for months. Okay, how badly they prepared is a separate matter and it's quite disappointing. As a consequence, uh, I think uh, Kazim Jomar Tokayev is an extremely skillful operator to balance things. He has all the good Soviet skills of a Soviet diplomat in the sense, and he will not make a mistake on that. And if uh, Lilian uh, Posner went back to this issue about Kazakhstan not having sovereignty and so on, and so forth, 2014, we must not forget that on the one hand, this was very stupidly said in a fairly complex sentence, but thereafter, uh, the Russian president was very thoroughly re-engaging with, uh, with Nur Sultan Nazarbayev. If you remember the, uh, the, the Astrahan meeting of the Caspian Sea states, I remember on mere television watching it, and the only person, only president who was hugged by Vladimir Putin, who was the host of the meeting, was Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, nobody else, although there were potential candidates <laughs> over there uh, from, from Ilham Aliyev to, to uh, Gurban Guliberdi Mohamedov. As a consequence, I think we have to see this, that this is a, a relationship. Of course, there are elements of uh, the industrialization and all the stories and the Russian ethnicity, but at the same time, Tokayev will also be very careful with the Russian minority, as he is very careful uh, with the with the uh, with the Uyghur minority issue. Have you ever heard him say anything straight? He's not going to use a straight language. He's even more indirect than his predecessor was on these matters, and I I, I trust that uh, the gentleman will be able to to run this show reasonably well. I, I think actually I learned a lot from this panel and I'm very grateful that I, I, was, I was able to contribute because all the other things that I heard were things that I don't know too much about. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot, Paul. Uh, no long uh, concluding remarks uh, from my side, uh, just to say that I believe that uh, this is the start of a debate, a debate that will continue for a long time, but hopefully in a situation uh, where there is a Ukraine that is independent, fully free, and at peace. Um, I would like to thank uh, IWPR, and I would like to recommend you to follow their series, because there will be more uh, similar virtual events. Also follow us with EUCAM. Uh, more importantly, I would like to thank the panel. Uh, they have done an excellent job. Um, they have uh, delivered a lot of insights uh, and managing to bring across so much in so little time. So I really applaud this. This is really uh, great. Thanks a lot to the panel. Thanks a lot to all the participants for their interest, for their patience, and apologies for all the questions that we could not address in this panel. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Abakom Sultan Nazarov uh, for his cooperation and for hosting this event. I would like to mention Sergei Marinin. It was his idea to uh, bring everyone together to discuss this issue. So he is the content and logistical mastermind behind this event. Uh, so on behalf of EUCAM, on behalf of IWPR, I sign out. Thanks a lot and have a great day. Goodbye.